Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. Where we continue to follow the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden now. Those are just some of the scenes overnight as thousands of Americans gathered in celebration of Osama bin Laden's death. Former Navy SEAL Rob O'Neill says he has thought about the mission every day since that May Day in 20. From multiple conversations you had with Rob O'Neill over the past year and a half, how'd you get And you described that his head kind of exploded yes, when you hit I, him. I actually hit him three times because I shot him twice when he was standing and once on the ground. That is the fucking American badass. Go, go, go. We are not going for fame and we are not going for bravado. We are going for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday morning, and then 45 minutes later, she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper. If you need help, hang up and then dial your operator. I'm Rob O'Neill, and this is the Operator Podcast. And here we are. Welcome back to the Operator Podcast. This is episode 71. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for staying with me. If you haven't uh, heard all the episodes, I recommend going back to the some of the first ones because that's a little of the historical stuff, some of the missions that I was a part of because I wanted to give you a little history about myself before I started talking about everything else, which is the theme, the overriding theme of the Operator Podcast, meaning me as a former special operator, myself being... Uh, a current operator of whatever it is I do right now, trying to keep the lights on, trying to keep the mortgage paid, trying to keep the mouths fed, trying to keep butts in seats and whatnot. And what you do as an operator, whatever you're doing to better yourself, better your family, your community, whatnot. Uh, the history is there. Now I uh, tell you what I think, and I want you to respond to me. I've mentioned before, at M-C-H-O-O-Y-A-H, at Makuya, on either Instagram or Twitter, or truth social if you get on that or i think you should use at the operator podcast on instagram because that one is not restricted i'm not complaining i'm just letting you know that some of the stuff i put on at mikuya you might not see because there are some limits to it but uh i also tell you my history so that when i say that i don't know someone or i wasn't somewhere you can you can always uh go back revert to that refer to that and see how full the shit i am but i am uh Former Navy SEAL, former SEAL Team 6 operator for a number of years, and now I do this. It's fun. And there's a lot going on in the world. We've been talking about what's happening in the Middle East. There's always something happening in the Middle East. Right now, it is um, the fight between Hamas and Israel, and we'll touch on that. But everyone is talking about that right now. What I wanted to bring up at first is... uh, Um, The stuff going on in Congress between stuff not going on and uh, stuff that is going on and a lot of the fighting, a lot of the arguing and then just what they can all agree upon is taxing us more, giving themselves raises and they take really, really long recesses. They take odd votes that are not just one line item at a time. They're chocked full of votes that a lot of people don't read that are so full of pork they could be a diner, lots of pork in there. And what pork is, is they just throw extra stuff in there for their district so they can get a bridge or a school or a building or a highway named after them. That's why. The, that's how you can buy a vote. You, you don't just buy votes from voters or dead voters or people who stuff ballots. Um, stuff like that. The, you, you can also, the, you ever heard of whips? Like they whip votes at uh, in, in uh, Congress and whatnot. And if you tell someone that we're going to throw this in for yours, they're probably going to vote for that bill that someone blah, 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 blah. So they do a lot of that. They're having trouble lately. They can't, the simple stuff, They, I mean, they're really, really good. They being the government are good at throwing money at everything from Ukraine to different countries that don't care about us. In episode 70, we did a little math on how, how, how long it takes to even count to certain numbers, but we as a government, we as taxpayers give so much free stuff away. We don't even bat an eye at a billion. A billion is like nothing when you consider how much a billion is. A thousand million, that's a lot. They're good at throwing that around, but they're not good at agreeing on anything because it's all party politics. 
It's mainly party politics. Sometimes you get some Republicans go to the Democrat side, which is weird. Democrats never do that. They rarely, rarely do that. Democrats are good at staying in lockstep no matter how horseshit their ideas are. Republicans, if they individually could hit their asses with both hands, I would be impressed. They um, they were, I, were they ever able to conquer that uh, dress code thing that's in the Senate? I mean, if you're doing something like that, you should be wearing at least a jacket uh, and a collared shirt. I do like uh, I do like some of the looks that some people pull off, but um, like uh, Jim Jordan, he's got the rolled up sleeves and like the loose and tie because I'm a working man. I kind of dig that actually. Uh, senators have a tendency to wear nicer suits because they're way more important. <laughs> at least they think they are. There's fewer of them. And their uh, terms are six years where uh, Congress, they get two years for different reasons, um, which I don't think are applicable now. But, you know, term limit should be whatever. But they couldn't really vote. It took them a long time. The Republicans couldn't get a speaker for a long time. They did. Mike Johnson's there. Um, remains to be seen how he's doing. Like, he, he comes in there at first all fire and like uh, Vic Vinegar, the security guard, but he's start, starting to realize that, uh, you know, you want to get through the year, so we're not going to push it that much, whatever. I think. I mean, it's got to be a, a weird position to go from someone who's unknown right to the speakership. Um, but obviously, he's got some seniority. He's been around, and he seems like, a, he, as far as conservatives go, he seems like a good conservative. I don't know enough about him. Um, but they had a hard time getting a speaker. They, the, It's like one side. It's, it's like when you watch a lot of those uh, people get in the, in the chambers and then they all start screaming and yelling and cheering and dancing and all that nonsense. Or you get a group of uh, miscreants that wear the wrong scarf for Africa and take a knee in the rotunda and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, th- there's been some lately in DC, some fun shenanigans. If you've seen the, some of the weird stuff going on, the, the president's um, granddaughter was, in Georgetown near her apartment, I guess, somewhere like that. And a couple dudes were trying to jack a car somewhere, and one of the Secret Service agents fired it, shot at him, like live ammo in Georgetown, which is a nice part of of uh, D.C. And I don't know much about the rules of engagement for Secret Service, especially in D.C., but this guy clacked a few rounds downrange, and uh, I- I'm I'm going to... F- dig for you if you if you know anything tell me on uh my social media what's going to happen with this because that after action report that aar has got to be something because you're firing live round like the bullet doesn't stop until it hits something or you know it could be the ground which it usually is. could be a wall a tree outside but he's he's uh he's up there throwing down like he's in a damn 80s rap video or something <laughs> I don't know what happened there. That's that's odd. They found well, there the papers are being released of what the FBI and the Secret Service did with the cocaine that was found in the White House, and they were saying forever it was found in the um, the library or whatever. But now they know exactly where it was. And well, there was a a blackout of the the security system in, in the most secure building in the world. But that that locker that they found the blow in, um was in the middle. I don't know how that works again. I don't have any of the stuff, but I guess someone requested a Freedom of Information Act and a bunch of stuff came out. They, they didn't, well, they, they found DNA on the baggie, unless, whatever. So that's happening up there. They, they actually got pictures of the bag of blow, too, if you see it. it's um, I think they, I don't know when they found it. They were saying the first family was out of town, but, you know, the word on the street is that that wasn't, a big enough bag of blow for you know a good weekend. It's like maybe a kick ass Friday night, but I don't I don't know. So that was going on with that, and then over a uh, over across town, not across town really, just sort of a congressional hop, skip, and a jump away in the big Capitol looking building. I guess there's some funny shit going on there too. A lot of uh, a lot of weird um, fights, if you will. There was a. Uh, Speaker McCarthy, who used to be the speaker, he was the one that got voted out. And there was eight Republicans that voted him out. That's how they got Mike Johnson in there. And I guess uh, there's a dude, a congressman from Tennessee, Tim Burchett, who was giving an interview to M- NPR, a live interview. <laughs> and I guess McCarthy and his entourage walked past. And I guess uh, McCarthy elbowed him in the back. And um, 
in a kidney or something. And you can, so you can hear it in the, the NPR woman, the reporter did give a, a report later an interview. And she said, yeah, he definitely got hit. And, uh, like Burchette sort of thought it was joking. Like, Hey man, didn't mean to get in your way there. McCarthy. And then he started to realize that was intentional because McCarthy didn't even look back and he chased him down and kind of said, Hey, here's the deal. You know, you don't do that shit. McCarthy denied it. And he, I I've met McCarthy. I never met, um, Congressman Burchette. I met, um, Congressman McCarthy, former Speaker McCarthy before. Don't know him well enough to say whether or not he would do that, but I do know D.C. well enough to know that they, you know, if he can get away with that bullshit, I'm, I, they might. Wasn't there. But he chased him down, and then like McCarthy said later, well, I'm trained how to box, and if I would have hit him, he'd have known and he'd have gone out or something like that. And then um, <clears throat> I guess George Santos, who's the – representative one of the representatives from new york in congress and he's just he's got some shit going on i don't have enough time to talk about everything he's um there were some protesters there they call themselves pro-palestinian uh, i think they're pro Hamas. a lot of i think a lot of people that are protesting for palestine don't really understand um what the hell is actually going on and who the people they're trying to defend really are if they did they wouldn't do it but frankly for people that age they don't know much anyway because Not that their age is, I don't think their age is a deciding factor. It's what they have and haven't been taught and the way that they've been indoctrinated. But they're in there because he, um, if you're not familiar with Santos, with George Santos, the, the, he was the one that was just kind of off with some of the stuff he was saying to get elected. Like he said he was Jewish. And then he goes, no, no, I said I was Jewish kind of making a joke. And then, uh, they, I guess the pro Palestinian pro Hamas anti-Israel crowd was in there and, that is a video a while a little bit back where he's running around through Congress and yelling at people. He's carrying like a two month old baby and yelling something about a baby. And you wouldn't treat a man with a baby. I guess they're trying to figure out whose baby that was. And then he rolls up recently holding the baby again, I think in, in the chambers and he's, he's, he's feeding the baby milk and they're saying that's uh Bobert's baby, Congresswoman Bobert's baby. And she's like a 36 year old grandmother, which is, I mean, this sounds like I'm really just, um, gearing up to tell you about this kick-ass new uh, soap opera, where uh, let's or a Scooby-Doo episode. Let's see who the real congressman is. So he's doing that shit. And then the the, the one I got a kick out of was um, was if you didn't see it, it was in the Senate. It was um, uh, Senator Mark Wayne Mullen, who I've actually gained new respect for because he he you know he he read a tweet from the president of the Teamster, Sean O'Brien. Uh, to his face, so they're in they're in the Senate, and he's reading whatever. He read the tweet, and it was pretty disrespectful. And it's a tweet, and it looked like he was going to kind of give it a grain of salt, but something about O'Brien said, um, you know, you're a, you're a fake, a phony. You've never worked. I'm paraphrasing. Never worked a real day in your life, and um, basically, he'd kick his ass anytime, any place. And then Senator Mullen said, uh, "Well, we're here in a time, we're in a place." He said something about it, want to do it right now. And O'Brien said, yeah, I'd love to. And he goes, stand up, boy. And he goes, you stand up. So he stood up. And then Bernie Sanders, of all people, he just starts. I mean, he did make a good point. It's like, hey, you're a you're a, you're a senator. Start acting like it. And he wouldn't let anyone talk, uh, he being Senator Sanders. and But, uh, I th- you know, Mark Wayne Mullen is, uh, I don't think he has a degree. I, I know he's a self-made man. I know he's a plumber. Um, I think he grew up near, um, a reservation, I, I, uh, something with Cherokee and I'm just saying the way he looks and being there and the line of work he's in, I'm assuming he's been in a fight in his life. And then, uh, um, Sean O'Brien's a, he's a teamster. He's a union guy. I work with unions quite a bit and, uh, he's from mass. He's from Medford mass. So I, you know, he's not like a, like Worcester mass. That's tough. Uh, I don't know much about Medford, but he went to UMass. I know those mass holes, they know how to fight. Most of them, um, maybe let them throw down. I don't know. Is it is is it uh, the time and place in the Senate for a senator to do that? Why not? <laughs> Something's got to give. Maybe maybe if we fought more, like man to man. I mean, I don't mean like the stuff where you're jumping people. and well, I mean, depends on who it is. But like, you know, if you agree to have a fight, not even necessarily an MMA type fight, but like a uh, like stand up fight. And if the guy goes down, you let it. Or I don't know, but something's got to give. I mean, you can solve a lot with a punch in the face. I mean, you you can you can stop a lot of people from running their mouths. I was actually trying to come up with a 
a list here of why and how you can solve things with a punch in the mouth. Uh, I was trying to make a list of five. I came up with a list of two. My top two reasons to punch someone in the mouth is one, they do it in the movies. And two, um, they you talk shit from the mouth. You talk smack from the mouth, you just smack them in the mouth. Yes, and, you know, technically you can knock people out, like whatever. But it kind of got me to thinking that um, maybe we should get back to duels. That's back in the day people used to duel. And they would fight to the death, though. So, uh, some to the death, some not uh, to the to the death. Some just kind of ended. But, like, uh, you fight with, like, dueling pistols and turn around and, and be a gentleman. And, and the linguistics was always good. You're always yelling insults, but grammatically correct, which is kind of funny. Do it with swords or whatever. Maybe that'd be the way to go. I don't know if a lot of these people would duel, though. I know they like to, to talk a lot, but I doubt it. But, I, you know, <clears throat> going through this, I was trying to think of what to say today because we're, we're kind of talking about the same stuff. I looked into duels. You know, where where would they duel? And people were dueling like they had midshipmen at the Naval Academy dueling over some sort of steam engine and to the death. Like Francis Scott Key's son well, was killed in a duel about steam. Um, but the one that fascinated me was in uh, 1842, a duel that took place. A little history for you here about <clears throat> either doing a little pre-op intelligence or getting beard to beard or nut to butt or whatever you're into. I don't care. I mean, this was 1842. It's not 2023. So they didn't get away with as much shit then. But they did stuff a, a little different then. But in 1842, a young guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln publicly, publicly published uh, thing he he chastised um, chastised a guy named James Shields in the course of a debate about banking in Illinois, where Abe Lincoln is from. And um, <clears throat> during the debate, I guess the ridicule pushed Shields to challenge future president, which means he didn't lose the duel. Uh, but you don't know how it ended yet, so let me so bear with me. Challenge Lincoln to a duel. So in August of 1842, the Illinois State Bank went bankrupt and announced that it would no longer accept its own paper currency from private citizens looking to pay off debts. Gold and silver, which most citizens did not have, you've heard me talk about that too, by the way, became the only acceptable currency. Think about that too, because um, they're printing money, if you can relate, monetary notes of legal tender, if you will, where all of a sudden they're worthless and you can only rely on precious metals. Well, um, Lincoln didn't like that, and he said that's bullshit. Not, not so many terms. Again, it's 1842. But he was chastising it, and, and Shields, the guy that uh, would eventually go on to fight. So James Shields was the state auditor, and he sided with his Democratic Party and supported the decision to close the bank. He wanted to close the bank so your money's no good. And he became a target for Whig, that's W-H-I-G, opposition to the financial plan. And Lincoln, then he was a self-described prairie lawyer, he added to the fuel by uh, fuel to the fire by writing a less than favorable editorial. You'll notice he described himself as a prairie lawyer, and uh, Shields was a Democrat. They didn't mention Republicans because you know Lincoln would eventually be the first Republican uh, president. If you didn't know that, put that in your pipe. Keep it there to smoke it later because it was actually the Republicans that freed the slave, and uh, the, well, the Democrats are actually founders of the KKK. A lot of weird shit goes back and forth. A lot of a lot of Hitler stuff thrown around still too. Anyway, the Whig opposition, they opposed it. Shields, the auditor, was a Democrat. Lincoln, the prairie lawyer, and he wrote an editorial. So what happened there was Lincoln was friendly with the editor of, of the uh, Sangamo Journal, which is the self-proclaimed oldest uh, paper in Illinois. <clears throat> and it allowed him, they allowed him to write a letter, uh, he wrote a letter under a pen name. I don't know why he chose Rebecca. Not making that up, he did. <clears throat> and he attacked Shields for his politics. And just because we got nothing else to do, no internet and no TikTok, he also attacked his uh, personal misadventures, if you will. So assuming the character of an Illinois farmer, Lincoln, under a pen name, wrote... Now listen to these fighting words. I've been tugging ever since harvest, getting out wheat and hauling it to the river to raise state bank paper enough to pay my tax this year and a little school debt I owe. And now just as I got it, lo and behold, I find a set of fellows calling themselves officers of the state have forbidden to receive state paper at all. So here it is dead in my hands. 
And notice he's talking about saving up money that was printed so he can pay taxes, which is theft. Had that issue back then, pissed off Perry Farmer. But Lincoln also went on. Now, here's where he gets into Shields' personal life. Because apparently, uh, I'm trying to think of ways to put this. We have different words nowadays, nowadays but Shields, the state auditor, was um, kind of famous for his pursuit of women. Um, and so Lincoln said, his very features in the ecstatic agony of his soul spoke audibly and distinctly, and in quote says, Dear girls, it is distressing, but I cannot marry you all. Too well I know how much you suffer, but do, do remember it is not my fault that I am so handsome and so interesting. I'm definitely changing my bio on social media. So anyway, um, so Lincoln showed the letter to Mary Todd. Now, Mary Todd Lincoln would be his future wife. Mary Todd and Abe Lincoln had recently gotten back together. They had been engaged, um, and then they just got back together because Lincoln called off the earlier um, engagement so anyway, he showed uh, Lincoln showed Mary Todd the letter, and she found it delightful. Then, a few days later, without Lincoln's knowledge, uh, Mary Todd submitted her own critique to the journal under the pen name Kathleen. Um, so Mary Todd seems to uh, have a, a taste of buggery in her soul. And actually, I did some digging, and I found some historians described Mary Todd as emotionally unstable and as an excessive spender who did little to support her husband in his times of need. <clears throat> that strikes me as someone that would say for the last time, Abe, just take me to the theater. What can possibly go wrong? Yeah. So anyway, so Shield saw that he did not take kindly to, to the letters and demanded the paper reveal Rebecca's true identity. And the paper did Mary Todd. Um, so, Shields gets the information and demanded a retraction. So he gets in touch with Abe Lincoln personally and says, you need to retract it. On September 19th, at the Tremont County Courthouse, Shields had a handwritten note delivered to Lincoln, which read, I have become the object of slander. Um, so slander is uh, the action of crime of making false spoken statements dam damaging to a person's like reputation. So I've become the object of slander. I like this word, vituperation, which is uh, bitter and abusive language and personal abuse. So if it was published, it's libel. It's neither here nor there. Slander, vituperation, um, and personal abuse. So Shields is pissed. Uh, only a full retraction may prevent consequences which no longer... Well, I'm sorry, which no one will regret more than myself. So basically he's saying, only you take this back and say you were wrong or shit's going to happen and I'm going to feel bad. Is what uh, Shields said. Lincoln refused to retract his remarks and returned Shields' letter with a request that Shields rewrite it in a more gentlemanly fashion. This is not how fights start in 2023. Instead of that, though, a gentlemanly fashion, uh, Shields challenged Lincoln to a duel. And it would be held in Missouri, obviously. Uh, that, that's because it was still legal to duel in Missouri, which is dope. Mizzou. Um since Lincoln was challenged by Shields, he had the privilege. He was challenged by Shields. So back in the day, I'm just getting this from reading, is that you can pick the weapon with which you duel. And he chose cavalry broadswords of the largest size. Um, he didn't want him. He didn't want the other dude to kill him. So he said, uh, uh, I think he basically said he didn't want Shields to kill him, which he thinks he would have done if they had pistols. So he uh, picked the big swords because uh he felt sure he could disarm him with the blade lincoln didn't have an intention of killing shields but i'm taller is what he's saying so uh lincoln was six feet four and he planned to use his height as an advantage um shields was uh five foot nine so six four five nine a little so Lincoln was six four. That's what tall president James Madison was actually the shortest president. Washington Adams Jefferson fourth president James Madison was actually five foot four shortest president. Good to know James Madison. Actually, I, I did some looking about him too. Um, he was around during the Revolutionary War, but he was unable to fight due to medical thing. Blah. I'm assuming his dad was a politician too. He didn't fight James Madison five four short guy. Didn't fight, almost joined the army. Ever met that guy? Anyway, so the day of the duel, September 22nd, arrived, and the combatants met at Bloody Island, Missouri, to face death or victory. Doesn't that remind you of, like, high school? I choose you, me and you, after school, Blood Alley. 
They picked Bloody Island, Missouri, because it's still legal there, and Bloody Island, why not? If we're fighting Missouri, we are fighting a Bloody Island. So as the two men faced each other with a plank in between them that neither could cross. So there's like a barrier there. And Lincoln swung his sword high above shields to cut through a nearby branch. And this act demonstrated um, the immensity, basically, of how tall Lincoln is, how short this dude is, and the strength, how badass Abe Lincoln was. And it showed shields that this was a fatal disadvantage. I can't reach him with a sword. He can reach me. I picked him. He got to pick the weapons due to rules. They're following rules. Um, And I guess there were bystanders because, you know, this is a long time ago, not a lot to do. I'm going to go watch the duel. So they were kind of um, yelling at him, whatever, and they called the truce. Yeah, so duels should be brought back. I'm not sure if we should break out um, broadswords of the, you know, the, the the largest degree or whatever the hell Lincoln said. But that's that. And we got weird stuff going on in in, um, in D.C. So let's let's go. Let's throw down. Let's solve some problems. Punch someone in the face. I uh, have a tendency to mention a lot of places where I travel because I do get around to it. It's actually refreshing to get off of the um, internet once in a while. Put the phone down for a full day. Great for your mental health. But uh, I talk about places where I've been. I spent a lot of time in New York and I was BSing over lunch yesterday um, with some friends from New York. And we were discussing uh, politics. Obviously, that comes up at everything, especially in New York. What's going on in the Middle East? What's going on in Washington, D.C.? Never a dull moment, but we were talking politics and kind of came up with like, it doesn't really matter which side of the aisle you're on. If you want to have a conversation about politics, it's generally the the entire, um, it's the economy stupid. And if you're running a, um, an administration, the economy sucks. You're probably not going to win your next term, be it two years like representative six years like um senator six years like senators or you know 56 years like senators or you know eight four in the four in the white house eight total if generally if you screw the economy you're not going to get it but now people are so divided it's just this party or just that party but what we decided is let's take a walk through one of the grocery stores and look at the prices see what it costs if you have people that are putting stuff back that they can't afford to buy and not like luxuries but necessities and you're trying to decide what to get uh because you can't afford all of it that's an issue with inflation that's an issue with what's going on in the world and i don't care about your politics how expensive is it to you to go to the store i you know i used to joke all the time when i go to the store no matter what uh, i'm gonna spend a 100 bucks if i go there for a greeting card i end up spending a bunch but now it's no joke like i'll go to uh i i'm, I'm up to i think a brown belt in crock pot because crockpots, you you know, it's just the basics. Know the basics. But if you don't have a crockpot, get one. But, I mean, just to go there, you get the, like, the spices, whatever, always. If you can read, you can use a crockpot. But just to gather the accoutrement for um, for a crockpot, uh, some sort of uh, Thai chicken thing I made. It was over 100 bucks. That's expensive for some chicken and some spices, a little bit of chicken broth, if you will. So that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's in our pocketbooks. That's how you can sort of judge what's happening in D.C. and... Um, that's the way, that's the way it is. And the economy's not, not looking great. They're going to tell you whatever you want to hear. They won't answer questions directly and they'll blame everything on. I always talk about the non-elected, um, bureaucrats who ooze around DC that make policy. If you want to make policy, put your name on the ballot and run. Don't, you know, but they don't do that. That's, that is called being a swamp creature. There's a lot of them. Some uh, swamp creatures do run eventually too but uh what i want to get at with that is that we're on the brink of an economic meltdown so we're talking about groceries i'm talking about threatening your savings in retirement inflation has surged to a 40-year high you budget carefully but each trip to the grocery store like we just talked about feels like a wallet pinching experience gasoline prices have doubled since 2020 and your monthly bills are escalating Inflation is with you all the time. It's an evil force that eats away at purchasing power and ultimately your ability to save for retirement that day that hopefully you can stop working. We all want to get there. Don't let this happen to you. You want to retire, so protect your retirement. I don't care how young you are. You want to get there and start working on your retirement, saving money, putting it somewhere. But protect your retirement here with my friends at Allegiance Gold. Alex, Mark, and the team will take the time to help you understand your options and make the best decision for your future. 
Whether your goal is to own physical gold or protect your IRA or 401k, the professionals at Allegiance Gold are ready to help. They've earned the highest trust ratings in the precious metals industry and have built relationships based on integrity, expertise, and impeccable service. So here's the website you need to go to, protectwiththeoperator.com. Protectwiththeoperator.com or call them at 844-790-9191 and get up to $5,000 in free silver on a qualifying purchase. Do not wait. Protect your future now with my friends at Allegiance Gold. That website is protectwiththeoperator.com. Protectwiththeoperator.com or give them a call 844-790-9191. Allegiance Gold will set you straight for retirement. I was talking to my buddy, Mike, who actually taught me to swim. If you haven't heard the story, it's in one of the very first episodes. I mentioned that I didn't know how to swim when I joined the Navy because I went to join the Marine Corps and the Marine recruiter was was not in the office. The Navy guy was in the office. I went to ask him, where's the Marine? Because the Marine Corps is part of the Department of the Navy. It's just the men's department. We all know that. Hardy, har, har. He said, why do you want to be a Marine? I said, I want to be a sniper. He said, look no further. We have snipers in the Navy. You need to be a Navy SEAL first, blah, 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 kind of dusted over that. I remember him. He was a chief, very creative. Um, But I ran into my friend Mike up at Butte, Montana, who was a swimmer. He saw me at the pool, and he said, "Um, what are you doing in the pool, in a nutshell? And I said, I just joined the Navy. I'm going to be a SEAL. He said, not like that. You aren't. Get back in the water. I'm going to show you how to do some strokes, which he did. I talked to him the other day, and he told me he just got off the dip. He quit chewing tobacco. Uh, I he you know he's a big chewer. A lot of people in Montana chew. Uh, I didn't start till after I learned to swim and then got into the Navy and I learned how to dip. Uh, actually, at a place where we couldn't. That was uh, San Clemente Island um, during land warfare because at the range a dip is great and I started dipping tobacco a lot right after breakfast or first thing in the morning with coffee. I had guys that were dipping. Um, while they were scuba diving on a dragger. And I'm not even sure if you can spit. That's just like either putting it in your um, exhalation tube on your dragger, which is hardcore because that's going to go through the scrubber and back into your mouth. Uh, that probably pissed off the people in sub ops, the diving people, the the Navy divers, the best diving in the world, SEAL team too, no big deal. But uh, yeah, dipping all the time. When we went overseas, if we weren't out saving the planet, getting the girls like we do as Navy SEALs, um, we would sit around, play Xbox, or go to the gym. Uh, the acronym SEAL is sleep, eat, and lift when you're not doing anything else. But we'd play Xbox. I do still have a black belt at Halo. Bring it if you want some. I'm not sure if you even play that anymore. But um, we would dip doing that, dip afterwards, dip at the brief, dip while you're giving a brief, dip in the Halo, uh, dip while you're going up to target. If you keep it in on target, that's fine. And then during the, uh, if I didn't have one in during the tactical questioning, the TQ, or as we did once call it, uh, battlefield interrogation, we'd dip there. So 20 plus years I was dipping. My buddy just said he quit dipping. Uh, I did too. And it was difficult. But see, I still loved the ritual. Loved the tradition. So I have told you before about Black Buffalo. My friends at Black Buffalo, they've been working on this forever. And it is, um, it's not tobacco. It's made from edible leaves, like cabbage, things like that. But it's got everything you need, the same texture, the same thing, the same kick-ass sound when it uh, when you do it. Every, everything you love, nothing you don't. There's long cut. There's pouches. Uh, it's, got, it's with or without pharmaceutical-grade nicotine. Edible green leaves. Food-grade ingredients. The flavors are great, too. They got straight blood orange, mint, peach, winter green. It uh, sells online. It will deliver right to you. Thousands of stores. Uh, go to the website, blackbuffalo.com. If you use code the operator at blackbuffalo.com, you get 15% off your first order. Uh, it's also got a store locator if it's nearby there. So if you are a dipper and you're 21 years of age or up, go to blackbuffalo.com. Honor your rituals. Black Buffalo was born in the Midwest, raised in the South. Charge ahead. Honor your rituals. Blackbuffalo.com. Code the operator for 15% savings. So we're going to have a little fun, though, because uh, The Operator Podcast, we talk about 
I generally do most of the talking, but I do want to, I'm working on new studios to get people in person. I think it's fun to have in-person interviews and it's a lot better to ad lib. I've, uh, if you haven't listened to my, uh, the, the episode I did uh, a little, almost a year ago with my brother, Tom O'Neill, it's pretty badass. Uh, it's just good banter back and forth. Other interviews I've had have, have been a lot of fun, but I want to get in-person stuff. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, expand a little bit, get a bigger studio. And it would be fun to get like, just, uh, you know, wherever I'm going to ha- hopefully have some studios around the country and just get people in there. It'd just be fun to talk as operators. Like I've mentioned many, many times before, I want to hear what you have to say. I'm, I'm, I'm not a subject matter expert in a lot of the stuff that I talk about, but I consider myself pretty well informed, which everybody should be. You should be well informed. And this is, I hopefully is a good place to do it, but don't get all your source uh, information from one source. Get it from multiple. Like it's uh, when we would do intelligence overseas, you want to get information from two, at least sources, at least two sources, hopefully three or more, multi-source because that the truth is somewhere in the middle with everything. That's why I don't trust when news report. Oh, I don't trust reporters anyway, or politicians. But whenever um, you'll see a lot of articles where they say an anonymous source, that's crap. I mean, I immediately think that's crap. You know, a senior. Pentagon official who asked not to be um, identified because he's a big pussy or whatever. Um, I, I, I have less less reason to believe it. The, the Bin Laden raid, which I can't get away from, all kinds of different stories written by people. Seymour Hirsch wrote uh, the, one of the most ridiculous articles I've ever heard. And people, for some reason, take his shit serious. He's a clown. He's a buffoon. Um, he's an asshat. He's a smack ass shit hook uh but he always does that he, he he did something in vietnam one time the my Lai massacre i think something like that and uh that was a great thing pulitzer prize type thing but now he just he writes shit to seem relevant with no sources he never names them i don't buy it but um same thing in afghanistan if you know if you if the the um you want to get it from different people so the chances of it being legit are better so um, I like having people on my show is, I guess, what I'm getting at, too. The Operator Podcast, I'm going I'm going to give you what I think happens in some different places, and I try to stay up on current events. I try to stay up on history, and if, if I don't know it, I like to brush up before I talk about it. There's nothing wrong with that at all. There's ways to do it now, especially with this thing called the World Wide Web. Uh, I was actually talking today... Um, earlier on a, on a call with, with a friend, and I, I said that, because we're talking about, you know, mental health is a big one too, especially with social media, cyberbullying, in-person bullying, and victimization. Um, there's, um, there's certain things that need to be happening out there, and you hear arguments all the time about, like, uh, letting the, let, I, I want to be politically correct, letting the crazies out of the loony bin. And let them run the streets. I don't think necessarily people need to be locked up. But if you seem to be a little bit crazy, maybe you should have access to the internet. Because there's a lot of wild, wild shit out there. A lot of it's fun, though. A lot of it is fun. And we're finding that conspiracy theories with time are proven to be true. A lot of the times, too. Which is weird because we're talking back in the day, if you look at the old Vietnam stuff, like Walter Cronkite, everyone just believed him. And then you look at what actually happened in Vietnam and the military industrial complex, what this, and, and now everything from uh, the earth is flat. I love to, to um, I have some rituals that I do before I go to sleep at night. And I have actually taken myself, I've slowly, slowly lessened the amount of ambient I take, which is great. That does come with, with better health and, and better decisions that I've recently made, I sleep better. But, you know, one of the things I like to do is when I'm in kind of my, you can do all kinds of stuff. Like you can close your eyes and meditate, which I like to do and put yourself to sleep. Um, you shouldn't look at your screens, allegedly. I know we all do. I mean, you shouldn't hit the snooze button on your alarm, but people do it. A lot of people do it. Uh, waking up a minute before your alarm goes off and like rolling over, realizing I still have a minute, stuff like that. But one, um, I will look at my screen. One of the things I like to do for my rituals is uh, read conspiracy theories, especially about flat earthers. Um, it's fun. I don't buy it. But they make a, 
a fun argument because they make stuff where you kind of got to say, yeah, I'll be damned. Huh. Makes a little bit of sense. And then with the whole, we didn't go to the moon thing and just, can we admit it was at a studio? They filmed it there. You hear, you know, cause Buzz Aldrin did, Dr. Buzz Aldrin didn't help us out very much when he's was asked the question, what, uh, what was the most dangerous part or the scariest part of the mission to the moon? And he's, and his answer like to a kid was that we didn't go. So that obviously fires them up. Why don't we fly over Antarctica when we go from Chile to, um, well, we don't go from Chile to Australia, but when people go from Chile to Australia, why don't they go over the, uh, you know, the Antarctica, the Antarcticans, the ice walls, and there's the firmament up in the, like, you don't, like, you don't, we don't, that's why when they launch a space shuttle, it doesn't go straight up. It arcs because it goes against the firmament and then lands in the ocean. They do it all in one day, but they record and re- release it to us later. I saw a picture of a, a 747-ish flying around with these big cameras on the side. And they said, that's your GPS. Um, it was it was fun. It's fun to read. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of shit on the internet is not real. A lot of it's fake, and a lot of it is to get a rise out of people. And once you figure out people... Like, I read... There's some... Uh, I, I don't have the names of... The flat earth folks, but there's some good ones. And I, I actually like how they interact with people and they'll say, yeah, I thought that too, but, and that's kind of a cool, uh, a cool way that they talk about it. And, and I've seen comedians, uh, that mention stuff about governments and conspiracy theories to the point where it's like, are they onto something like Eddie Griffin did the firmament one and did the pyramids find that on the internet. It's fascinating to watch because you start to listen to it. And George Carlin, who is one of my idols. And he brought up stuff that people thought he was nuts and just a, a hippie, a dope smoking hippie that blah, blah, blah. And he would tell you the government doesn't really give a shit about you when it turns out. The more we learn, the more we realize that they actually don't. And one of the conspiracies I heard was that somehow with the, you know, the pyramid in the eye, when you do that, that signal for the, the secret societies and whatnot, that they'll tell some comedians the truth. So Because the comedian's job is to talk people into stuff to entertain them, be it the irony of a punchline, uh, back when comedy could be funny and stuff like that. The theory, the conspiracy theory is they've told, the Illuminati have told comedians um, the truth about what's actually going on because when they get on stage to entertain, they will say this, but people in the audience will think, well, that's just uh, comedy. So he can't be telling the truth. Look up Eddie Griffith stuff, man. It's it's uh, it's it's cool. And if, if you're bored to watch... Um, Undercover Brother, great movie. Doogie Howser was in that, the same guy that played the pimp on How I Met Your Mother. He's in that, and he he's the only white guy working in uh, in the Undercover Brothers, um, uh, like all black uh, uh, um, office space. Like he's a cop, and they asked him how they asked Doogie Howser, who having experience as the whitest guy in the room, he's the whitest guy in the room. And Undercover Brother asked him why he got hired. He said affirmative action. Uh, amazingly placed joke. That's back when we could be funny and actually joke with each other and realize that a lot of people are good. But but uh, the point, I guess, I was making before I said a lot of that stuff and was bad mouth. I never, having said that, never met Seymour Hirsch. Love to talk to him. I'd love to talk to anybody. A lot of the people with whom I disagree and people I've met actually in person, having disagreed with them, it is fun to meet them because if you can just not scream at someone and not name call someone and just honest to God, listen and try to get your point across. And when your point is done, just listen to them. Maybe it can work, but it's always fun if you have a legitimate informed argument, you know, nothing wrong with that at all. I, but I, I do see guys get owned on, on camera and all these stuff. I mean, especially from the left, let's call it what it is. They start screaming. Well, you're just a misogynist racist and you hate women and you're anti-trans Phobia, phobia, pho- blah, 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 ism, ism, ism. That, you know what? That's a boring argument, and you might be one of those people I was talking about earlier that might not deserve the internet. Um, yes, or, you know, you might need a background check before you go start. <laughs> not today, Satan. We're going to talk about that one later. But to have fun, because I do want to hear your input on where we're going with this. There's a thing going on in San Francisco called APEC, which is the Asia-Pacific Economic cooperation it's a forum that promotes trade right and it started out with 12 members back in 1989 but because the world is getting smaller and flatter um it's grown to 21 to include china russia japan the u.s and australia and i guess what they do there is uh 
it, they don't talk military stuff. It's not because of a war that they do this. It's because of uh, commerce and trade. And we are in that, obviously, the United States, because we're fucking badass. Uh, because we have um, a lot of our ports are on the, in, in the Pacific. China does a lot of trade, if you've noticed. They do a lot of stuff, too. And what China likes to do is they, well, they build stuff using child labor, slave labor, and then we buy it because it's cheap for them to produce. They can sell it to us overpriced. They make money. Uh, we virtue signal. They own a lot of the um, a lot of the stuff that's made for certain people is made there very very cheaply. But we buy it. I buy it. You buy it. Um, China wants to be there to talk trade because what they're saying at APEC, the Asian Pacific Economic um, Cooperation, is it's not countries. It's more consumers. So there's. A lot of stuff going on in the world. You got Russia involved, so they're probably not going to send a lot of people there to this thing today. Uh, there will be some low level. Putin's not going because because he likes to get himself into some shenanigans that we're involved with. So he's not going to be there. The whole Ukraine nugget that we've been been talking about. Obviously, we're talking about Israel um, and what's happening over in the Middle East. So sensitivity, sensitive, sensitive is happening. Um, but countries are gathering together, and the hullabaloo. Love to to I love to better myself with a with a word. So McTeams would be happy with hullabaloo. That's one of his go tos. At McTeams too is his uh, Instagram. Got to get him on here I, again. Another guy that I'm waiting for to have a uh, studio proper to have more angles, more cameras, and have some guests. But uh, hullabaloo is his word. Some of that stuff is going on there in San Francisco because San Francisco is a dirty-ass city run by communists. And uh, I've heard pundits and... I don't even know if investigative reporters would be the way to say it, but people that want to tell you the truth, I've heard them say as recently as early November that just you watch and they the government is going to clean up um, San Francisco. There will be no more needles. They will get rid of the um, the homeless folks that are out there, the tents. I love, too, how they're saying that uh, with the homeless people, well, you, you know, because they're playing the victim stuff, that camping has become illegal. Well, it's not really camping, I don't think, on a sidewalk if you're dookie in there and then uh, scaring away the, the customers and, and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, some some people were saying they're going to clean this whole place up, and uh, and sure enough, they did. I mean, you got power washers out there; they're scrubbing the the boom boom out of the cracks in the streets and the cracks in homeless people's butts before they shoo them off, taking down tents, putting up fences around the place too, which which is odd because these are all the people that that uh, walls don't work. Yeah, they do, but walls don't work. They're putting them up though. And, you know, it's uh, the federal government could have done something about this. It's almost depressing to see what a local and state government can do when properly motivated. The, mo- the motivation here, obviously, is you want to try to make yourself look good because of the world leaders from 21 countries, 21 countries now involved, uh, coming in for APEC. And they want it to look good for those people, for the economy, for China. Uh, for, not, but, not, see, the people coming in know what a... What a um, left this communist city San Francisco is. They know what happens there. They're not dumb. They spy on us using TikTok. China especially. Russia knows. They know what's going on there. They're also aware that we're going to clean it up for them, and they kind of want to see what good little communists our state and local governments can be in California, which they are. They are cleaning it up for the communists. They're not. Have you noticed they're not cleaning it up for the taxpayers? San Francisco and California are cleaning it up for the voters. You know why that is, too? Because they're Democrats and they're going to get those votes. Isn't that sad? That's the whole definition of insanity. You you want something new, but you keep doing the same stuff. They keep voting these people in. I mean, I don't think Joe Biden is going to run for president. I don't think he's going to make it that far. I just You, you already see all these people that uh, are coming out, strong, uh, uh, powerful people in the Democrat Party. Uh, Axelrod was just saying that uh, he's trying to talk him out of it. Axelrod's obviously in the Obama camp, who's pretty much part of the crew that's running the Biden administration. And he's coming out saying that he doesn't think he should run because, I mean, the guy's the oldest president ever, and he wants another four years. Probably not going to happen. 
And then Joe Biden called Axelrod a prick <laughs> or something like that. So there's talk about him not making it. Uh, but, the, I mean, the thing is, it's crazy to see that the government... Well, okay, backing up to to wanting wanting something different to happen after doing the same thing, the guy that's really gearing up to run for president is the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, and he's sharp as a tack. He knows what he's doing. I'm not saying he's... I mean... He's he is bullshitting you, uh, and everything he's touched as far as uh, politics has t- turned to shit. Look at everything he's run, and San Francisco. Is, I mean, they're cleaning this place out right now. San Francisco out right now. They've got international news reporters and cameras there to document San Francisco after they got people out. And there was a news crew from Czech Republic that got robbed at gunpoint already. That's badass, USA. Um, but yeah, so Gavin Newsom, he's kind of clearing it up and he's the one like, I mean, he's the one, did you, do you remember when Joe Biden left the white? Well, one of the times that Joe Biden left the white house, Gavin Newsom rolled through the white house. He's out there in the Rose garden by himself, basically taking measurements and whatnot. Um, yeah, he did that one time too. I I've always said too, that if, um, do you remember when those, uh, pro Palestinian slash pro Hamas slash terrorists were outside of the white house and they were, um, they were shaking at it, whatever they're, they, I mean, I don't know why the secret service didn't do much more to them than they did, but the only good news is, uh, it's like you could save, you could save invaders time. Hey, if you're looking for the president, don't check the oval office. Cause he ain't in there. <laughs> he might be on the beach. Um, but yeah, so they cleaned it up and it's just scary to think. And I, and I'm not just blaming president Biden for this. Also president Trump didn't do it. And before him, president Obama, they could shut this down anytime because the, the federal government, the state and local government can't afford this, and they need federal. Uh, they need some federal funding. All the federal government needs to say is, uh, if you don't clean this shit up, we're not going to pay you. And they would clean it up just like they did just now, and they could do that. We've seen it before with bridges in Philly that collapse. They they need it for commerce, and a lot of the cars that go over it, and all of a sudden it's fixed overnight because they can do it when they want to. Just not a lot of money in fixing problems. We've said that before, but they're doing it there. They're all you know they they, they do this once in a while the, during twenty and twenty one uh, because of the. I hate when they say because of the COVID, the COVID uh, pandemic. It, it, no, it wasn't a pandemic. It was a government lockdown. They didn't have it in twenty and twenty one. They they had it in Bangkok, Thailand, Thailand last year. President Biden didn't make it. He sent Vice President Kamala Harris there. You've heard of her, I think. She went there. I'm sure that was riveting. Uh, and they do stuff there. They talk about whatever. They kiss each other's butts and they hand out. Um, they hand out prizes <laughs> to each other so they can prove how great we are. It's kind of like that circle you stand in when you all stare at each other, talk about how awesome we all are. That's what they're going to do there. Clean it up. Um, they they give out gifts. This is kind of cool. Like they handed out, um, the United States handed out bombardier jackets, the leather coats. That's kind of cool to the different countries that are there. I think I think the last time that we hosted was um, maybe 2021 in Hawaii. Does that sound about right? Sure. I don't think President Obama handed anything out there. Uh, tw- not 2021, 2011. Um, yeah, but that's happening. It's just so interesting to see how fast they can clean it up when they when they want to. But they can also keep it a, a, a shithole to get the funding they're always going to get. For some reason, I don't know why. But uh, lots of people coming. Lots of people here today. San Francisco is a beautiful city, too. From afar. San Francisco is beautiful from the bridges. Once you get in there, unless you got a couple days right now to get in there, check out San Fran and... Uh, Get some rice aroni, I guess, the San Francisco treat. <laughs> but the, the reason that this is important is uh, because they're getting together to talk about finances, like I mentioned a second ago. And I'm not a finance guy. I do not have an MBA, and I'd never played in the NBA. <laughs> so there you have that. But um, they're discussing economic stuff and President Xi is coming here from China, who has been called one of the darkest people i think um i think bill barr said that it wasn't bill burr it was probably bill barr someone that was an official in the last administration the trump administration said president Xi was one of like the darkest coldest people he's ever met like the dark eyes has like two friends one of the friends was sent over here uh, a couple of weeks ago i think that i mentioned it to set up this meeting in san francisco 
Uh, the reason it's important, though, is because, and I don't know who, if they've been saying this, but there's something with the uh, MSCI in China, which is the, it's like an index for their stock market, whatnot. And they don't have a sh- shitload of investors over there because everyone's kind of like the, like Lothar of the Hill people in a lot of the places. But they took a big hit, and I want to say like $2 trillion, and I did some count, I did some countings last year or something. Uh, takes 38 years to count to a trillion. They they're down two, so it's not doing that hot. And they're they're not as economically strong, I think, as as they like to say they are. So they're sending President Xi over here, and he's going to talk to President Biden because the way it works in China, as far as I know, having never been to China, is they make their money off exports. They sell stuff cheap. They make stuff cheap, sell it expensive to people like us. We buy a lot of their stuff, and then. They take the money back and then they, they're communists. Well, the only thing they're really interested in is spreading communism, which works out well for them because a lot of uh, people in power in this country are interested in spreading communism, as are other countries. And they kind of like the whole one world thing. They want the one world government for the power and the curse the Illuminati, uh, Klaus Schwab, the Great Reset, all that stuff. But if we stop buying their stuff, which could happen, I mean, there's arguments why China hasn't, taken Taiwan yet and if they do when and it's got to be soon within the next year probably because I think there's going to be a new president in the White House possibly a former president back in the White House remains to be seen and we've got a lot of time before then thank God I'm sure we'll be hearing about it and that'll be fun to talk about because no matter what it's either going to be DeSantis is worse than Trump and Trump's as bad as Hitler or Trump is now worse than he was a while ago, and they won't tell you why. They won't tell you know. They won't tell you that we did have the petroleum oil reserves full, and and gas was down for us, and we were drilling, and we were energy independent, and we had deterrence across the country, and we were not starting new wars. We were sort of negotiating other things, but it's going to be fun to watch it. But China's got a choice to make. Like if they do, one of the things that we will be able to do is stop buying their product. And, and if if it comes to the United States not buying stuff from China, speaking of the NBA, I'm not sure what they'll do, but th- they're not going to have the money that they want. They won't have the power they want. So there's going to be a negotiation there today, hopefully. And both President Xi and President Biden are there. I think, this is me personally, I have met... Joe Biden, but I've never discussed foreign policy with him. We talked more about fishing in Montana and things like that, and everybody was in a good mood because we just killed Osama bin Laden a couple days prior. But I don't think he has a grasp on a lot of things. I don't think he was. As, I don't think he's as sharp now as he was when I met him in 2011, and I certainly don't think that he has he, a lot of foreign policy stuff. He's never been strong with. He was one of the guys that didn't want us to go after Osama bin Laden, if you remember that correctly. And um, even President Obama, man, we're talking about a lot of presidents now. Even President Obama said never underestimate Joe's ability. I think he said to fuck things up, uh, the decisions he makes. So I don't think that President Biden will be there to talk. He'll make a few statements, but then he'll be told what to say. And then the Secretary of State, who's been really busy lately, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State is the top diplomat for the United States. And then I think Jake Sullivan will probably be there, who is the the hell's he do again national security advisor something like that and they're going to talk to him but there could be a way to leverage the fact that we are the only ones really buying their stuff they're not going to be selling to uh iran 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 iraq i suck and then i don't think russia has any money <laughs> to buy stuff so that might be the good news with the leverage that we might have for now that's happening in san francisco isn't that a blast but it is important to just pay attention, see what happens there, and then how quickly we could forget about it and get on to other stuff. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, I think the foreign policy stuff. Oh, uh, no, I did want to mention this, too. <clears throat> Whenever you see President Biden, he mentions that he wants to discuss climate change with China, which tells you how far out of whack he is with life, because China is the world's number one polluter in the world, and they could not care less. They don't care. <clears throat> They're going to keep buying Iranian oil. They'll make whatever they can there. They'll get it from Russia. They don't care if they get it from us. They really don't care how much. Like when you recycle, if it goes to China, it just goes right in the ocean. Same with Central America. Uh, just stuff that 
you know, they, they don't care. And we're going to, yeah, Biden's going to go talk to Chi about um, climate change. And then that's that's our biggest national security issue, according to the Democrats. And again, I think Biden's just saying that because he remembers some talking points from people who tell him what to say. So the leverage there, which sort of is a deterrent, it could be economically a deterrent. Why China's not starting World War III, that could be part of the reason. Um, a lot of food for thought, but there we are with that. Something that I like to do, I, I try it, I think I'm successful quite a bit, is if I was never involved with something, I'll tell you I wasn't involved, I wasn't there. Uh, even if, on stuff that uh, I obviously wasn't there just because of the timeline, I'll tell you. I wasn't there, but here's what I have heard, what I have read. I try to do my research, too, and uh, because it's good. If, if, you, if you listen to someone, also try to find out where they got their information because they could be partisan, believe it or not, and just be telling you what you want to hear. It's important to uh, trust but verify, I think, is the term that they do. So I don't want to talk trash about people I've never met, so I will, I'm doing my best not to if I do. There we are. If I haven't met you and I talk trash, that's just, it is what it is. But what I do have experience with is um, war. I've been to war a bunch of times. And also I have experience with babies because I do have children. And war has rules. Babies do not. I know a little bit about both. I do know about my kids. So if I want to talk trash, you will not hear me say I've never met them, but because I've met them. But dirty diaper, screaming fits, sleepless nights. Parenthood is not for the faint of heart. I'm telling you, I know from experience. Tactical Baby Gear was founded by parents for parents with kit that you'll be proud to carry. You'll overcome every spit-up, blowout, meltdown, everything along the way. Prepare for whatever uh, parenting can lead you to, and you're going to look cool doing it because looking cool is part of the whole deal. If you look like you know what you're doing, you might know what you're doing. One of the things that uh, Tactical Baby has is these uh, wipe pouches. They're cool wipes. They have them in what they call the E&E kit, which stands for escape and evasion. And sometimes with kids, you want to escape and evade them. But people want more wipes uh, because babies are unpredictable, believe it or don't. But uh, eight wipes per resealable pack, and you can get them in 10 pouches per pack for 5 bucks. So get complete diaper kits, seven different mod panels. I talk about that with the hook and pile tape, the Velcro, tactical totes. I'm perusing the website here, tacticalbabygear.com. It's fun it's just to stroll around because I'm looking for strollers. Uh, the Versal Stroller Wagon, the grows with your family. You can put kids there. There's two-seaters, four-seaters, the Veer Cruiser. All that stuff is really neat, plus you can... Uh, uh, you know, it's 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 like I said, it's made for parents. Tactical stuff. It looks great. Molly Systems, highly functional, highly practical, extreme high quality. It's always ready. Diaper bags, berry, uh, baby carriers, strollers, wagons, everything in between, and a lifetime warranty. So go to check this out for shopping. Plus, Christmas is coming up. There's always birthdays, and there's always people having kids. Tacticalbabygear.com. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. It's entertaining, to say the least. Tacticalbabygear.com. And use code THEOPERATOR to save 15% at tacticalbabygear.com. Code THEOPERATOR, where we don't say, don't tread on me, we say don't poop on me. Tacticalbabygear.com. Code THEOPERATOR, 15% off. Also on Instagram, at tacticalbabygear. Instapoo. Then, uh, oh, God, guns, and diapers, baby. Tacticalbabygear.com, code the operator. I do need to touch on, again, what is happening in this country because you've heard me, I think, mention before that unfortunately a lot of people who are out there protesting what they perceive as pro-Palestinian are actually siding with Hamas, the ruthless terrorist organization full of complete scumbags, a lot of psychopathic killers in Hamas. They're no different than ISIS. Even Al- I mean, those two, ISIS and Hamas, are even a level above Al-Qaeda as far as depravity. I mean, I'll, I mean I'm not, believe me, fuck Al-Qaeda. But uh, Al-Qaeda's really good at stabbing you in the back. Al Qaeda is really good at waiting until you think you're safe, till you've lulled, lulled yourself into a sense of uh, safety, of, of complacency, and that's when they're going to hit you. They're going to hit you hard, but they don't do a lot of boasting. ISIS love that shit. They'll stab you in the front, they'll cut your head off. Hamas has proven what they'll do. Horrible, horrible stuff. More and more reporters from this country are seeing the GoPro footage of these 
I always halt myself when I say animals. They're not animals. Animals you can respect. Animals you feel bad killing sometimes. Or say a little prayer after after you kill them, you know, hoping they go to wherever their afterlife is and thank them for sacrificing their body for your meal, that kind of shit. That's not what Hamas does. Hamas, they they were calling their parents after literally talking body counts with their parents, talking how many of the... Uh, how many Jews they killed and were describing them and like put mom on the phone because she'd be proud of me too. And these are dudes that are, uh, um, that are going, going into people's houses on a holy day uh, or very, very early on a day of rest. And I mean, I'm talking about your worst nightmare, the shit that would have you wake up in the middle of the night, scared to check your house nightmare. And then all of a sudden the devil's there. And they would do things to people in front of their families, in front of their loved ones that I'm not going to say. I don't want to put that back in my own head. I mean, I've seen some bad shit. And I have imagined what would happen if ever you were alone with a group of these people. And they came in with a lot. And they didn't just come in as Hamas. They came in as Hamas. And then the innocent, peace-loving Palestinians followed them. And they were doing the raping, too. And it wasn't just raping girls. It, it was girls, young girls, babies, and boys, raping whatever they want, doing these unspeakable things to people. Then they would sit at their table and eat the breakfast they'd prepared for their families after they killed them and bragged to their um, parents over the phone. After they'd uh, done whatever the raping and pillaging and stealing and looting, demonic shit that they were doing. And they were happy about it. And... They're, and, and Unfortunately, a lot of the people in this country, they're hearing from TikTok what they should be saying. And they're, they're, they get their news from TikTok, which is written by China, which is an algorithm. And we were talking earlier about what China needs to sell to the United States. They, one of China's biggest worries is that we will ban TikTok because we're not buying it from China anymore. China's getting money to feed their communism, and they love to feed their communism with shit like that. But that's the kind of news that's coming out. And then on the internet, too, is mainly should be just for fun. And, you, and like I was saying earlier, you need to get more than one source. But a lot of these college kids especially think they're they, – and they're, they're, they, they think they're – Protesting for justice. I mean, I understand that you don't want innocent people to get killed. Stop the genocide. What they don't understand is Hamas is the occupier. You know, Hamas is the problem. Any bit of humanitarian aid that gets to Gaza goes to Hamas. They build tunnels. They build shitty missiles. They get guns. They order um, copies of Mein Kampf, which is Hitler's book. And they found a lot of... They're, they're, we got guys in the tunnels now, by the way. And they're finding not just copies of Mein Kampf, but highlighting the parts with the Jews and what they should do with the Jews and the the final solution type shit. And they're finding underneath children's hospitals, headquarters, and suicide vests and booby traps. God no, and I mean, the hostages are booby trapped too. A lot of hostages have already have already died. And if these queers for Palestine people and these college students would just have a moment with Hamas, they would realize what a horrible decision they made. It's like the the founder of the satanic church, when he died on the table, came back to life, and like his last thing he said was, what have I done? This is the hard way. I mean, it's not difficult to understand. Think about this. I don't care which side you're on. Who would you rather be captured by? The Israeli Defense Force or Hamas? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think the good guys do? What do you think the bad guys do? They're the bad guys. You think they're going to stop there? This is Iran. These are the mullahs in Iran. And this is their ideology. They brag about how we love life, but they love death. They're taught that. You only know what you're taught. And these people are taught from a very, very young age, death. Death to, and Israel's the little Satan, by the way. America's the great Satan. And because of our politicians, look at our borders. Do you think they're not here? Are you that naive? And do you think that they're not going to go to a gun-free zone like a university campus? There are no safe spaces when Hamas shows up. You better be able to defend yourself. You better be able to fight. And most importantly, you should be able to recognize the difference of who is good and who is bad. I mean, uh, another really good indicator is if um, Rashida Tlaib is screaming and hollering about something that's probably 
the side you shouldn't be on. The squad has no fucking idea what they're talking about. They're talking about how they want peace and a two-state solution. Look back at the videos of when there were four of them. God knows how many they are now. They're holding up, uh, looking at a globe or holding up a map, and they had taken Israel off of it. It's all said Palestine. <clears throat> that's your whole river to the sea. That's getting rid of Israel, killing all the Jews. That's what they want. But it's not just that. Look at these huge protests. Look at them ripping down American flags on Veterans Day in New York. As the NYPD watches, as the NYPD has to barricade themselves in places because these terrorists are coming after them. Well, I guess the problem in New York now, too, is we just keep forgetting to never forget. There are terrorists here. They're doing it in London. They're doing it in France. The only country that's really stepping up, believe it or not, is Germany. Because Germany's seen what happens with this anti-Semitic shit, and this is how it starts. It starts with socialism, it starts with communism, getting rid of the nuclear family, getting rid of God. And they're there. Look look at the how many hundreds of thousands of people are showing up. The the issue the issue is not Islam, it's this version though. A lot of people escaped this version of Islam, but for some reason we let they they try to get away from Sharia law, but we let the jihadis come with them and they try to bring Sharia law with them. Why do you think nobody wants to take Palestinians? No Muslim country wants to take Palestinians. Everywhere Palestinians go, they cause a problem. And the jihadis are doing the same thing. Look at Charlie Hebdo in France. There are terrorist attacks. We've seen it in Germany. They interviewed, um, there was a cop in London that they were tearing down British flags, but not Palestinian flags. And someone asked them, Look, a, a local, a Brit asked them, why are you doing this? And uh, he said, the cops said, he was caught saying what they're not supposed to say. He said, there are way more of them than there are of us. That's pretty scary. That's another type of invasion. We've had leaders, Gaddafi from Libya said, we will beat the West without firing a shot. It, they're bringing it with them. If you look at pictures of women in Syria in the 60s compared to now. Look at women in Afghanistan in the 70s compared to now. Look at women in Egypt back then compared to now. They're bringing it with them, and they're they're not they're not trying the the multiculturalism that we would think of. Oh, look at that! We get better music, cool dancing, and better music. No, they're bringing Sharia law, and you will obey. And that's this version. And we, I mean, we need to realize this. We need college kids to realize this because they're the next generation. We also need the moderate Muslims to stand up. You can't. A lot of moderate. You get they get too far with this. The moderate Muslims are going to get killed just as fast as, as you will. What did um. Winston Churchill say to Neville Chamberlain, he said, uh, you were given the choice between war and dishonor. You chose dishonor, and you will have war. You're going to get both. And this nonsense of tolerance that's been pushed for a long time on purpose, by the way, has made the truth toxic. You can't even tell the truth. It's It might be coming around. I mean, I hope... A lot of Europe's gone, man. It ain't, you know, not uh, not Eastern Europe, not Poland. They're smart enough to realize that the first key to a sovereign nation is a strong border. And we're we're raising people to think differently. We're raising people that everyone gets a trophy, everyone gets a blue ribbon. Oh, you can't get to the standards? Well, We'll just lower the standards. I mean, I was mentioned maybe a week ago that someplace out on the, the left coast in the United States, you don't even need any skills to graduate high school. Now they're saying you don't need any skills to be a teacher. Why? Because a lot of teachers are leaving. Why? Because they're getting beat up by kids that are being raised as victims. We're raising people as victims. You're the victim. You're the oppressor. You start teaching a kid that they're a victim and that's the oppressor and start teaching younger kids they're the oppressor, they're not going to like each other and it turns to violence. I mean, they, 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 they teach that stuff and then the victim starts to believe it and the problem is eventually that victim grows up and then the victim's in college and victim signalers, the more they signal that they're victims, the more they have a tendency to get very violent in packs. You're seeing that. I talked about duels earlier. That should be one-on-one. -on -one. These are the participation trophies that we're giving out to people. The the insulation, the helicopter parents, everyone's risk averse. You learn from failing. As someone who fails all the time, I'm le hopefully learning. 
but people now want uh, to show a participation pro- participation trophy and immediate satisfaction. And even like even even the uh, even the well-to-do families. You got uh, you got your parents there, helicopter, bottle, drink this, prep school. Um, you know, you're not playing outside. You're not getting cut. Here's your job. Now you're in charge. Boom. You're the 28 year old CEO. Immediate satisfaction. A lack of discipline that delays immediate satisfaction creates fragility. Fragility, violence, name calling, yelling, screaming, crying. This is a result of what communists wanted a long time ago. And it's kind of scary, man. I mean, I'm, it, look, I'm trying to be nice. I'm just trying to point it out. I'm just telling the truth. I'm not going to call you a name. And again, I'd rather get in a room with someone and talk it out. Instead of screaming names at people, but that's that's what a lot of people are doing right now. You see it everywhere. I'm I'm guilty of it too. But like I said, I mean, you you shouldn't be afraid of failure. Uh, f- failure is how you learn. It's an experience. If you keep failing over and over, you might need to change something because that's the definition of insanity. We talked about that. Doing the same thing over and over, you fail, you get up, dust off, move on. Get it. So, trying to be nice, trying to be fun. The Operator Podcast, we're really enjoying ourselves here. I'm glad that you uh, you keep joining me every week. I'm trying to be more consistent. So just um, don't be afraid to drink water out of the hose. Maybe challenge someone to a duel. If you do, pick the big sword, and you're never out of the fight.